All right, guys. So last time around, we had this data set up where interest rate percentage was the X independent variable and median home prices was the Y dependent variable. We had this data set up and we had a regression output which looked like this. Okay. Today, what we want to do is understand this regression output and understand where these numbers are coming from and what do they really mean. So I've got one better. I have an annotated version of this, which is what I'm going to use for this video. So let's go over and look at this. So I've kind of uh, picked up a bunch of numbers which I feel are important and worth the discussion. So let's go over them one by one. Now, right away when we look at the regression outputs, notice there's a structure to it. There's a regression statistics, there's analysis of variance, ANOVA, and then We've got these coefficients, standard errors, t-stat, p-values, and confidence intervals. So we've got these three sections to it. This is the regression output that we get from Excel. Now let's go over them uh, one by one. First off, we should see right away that we have 16 observations. This is telling us the data points that we have. And if we, in fact, select this data column, we can see these are in fact 16 entries on bottom right. So these are in fact 16. So this confirms the number of observations we denoted by N. There's also a column for degrees of freedom. And in front of regression, it says one. This is in fact the number of variables in our data set. So, and these are independent variables. We denote them by K. In our case, interest rate percentage was the only independent variable and this is why we only see one in degrees of freedom here so the value of k is in fact one now there's an expression n minus k minus one which results in 16 minus 1 minus 1 equals to 14 now this is also the degrees of freedom but and, and this is an important expression because when we talked about t distribution in the previous videos what we really uh, used in for degrees of freedom was n minus 1. But here in regression, we are accounting for the number of independent variables. And for that reason, we are plugging in k as well. So we're not just subtracting 1, but also the number of independent variables. So for a, for a data set where we have multiple independent variables, say something else instead of in, along with interest rate, uh, then you would see the value of k to be 2 if there are two independent variables. And then you would have n minus 2 minus 1 showing up as the degrees of freedom here. And this is an important expression. It gets used in a bunch of places. Uh, we'll see in just a moment. So n minus k minus 1 is right here for us. k is also available to us. And the number of observations n is also available. So that being said, let's move on to the other uh, important numbers here. Now I'm going to look at this r squared, which is the coefficient of determination or this is the goodness of fit. Now, for a data set like this, where there's only one independent variable, it's easy to plot it. It's easy to get an idea and look at what it looks like, right? So for that, we could, we could see how good the fit is and whether or not the best fit line takes into account as many data points as it can, uh, or there is a bunch of data sets uh, on one side of uh, the line and there are a bunch of data sets on the other side of the line the line passes through the middle so it's a good fit line so that makes that makes sense but then r squared here is telling us how good that line is so 0 0.38 is one value this is between 0 and 1 the closer it is to 1 the better fit it is 0 0.38 here is not a very good number as we can also see some points are pretty much away from the line others are closer the line is trying to accommodate as many points as it can so it's not a it's not a super nice number but it is what it is but it is telling us how good the fit is so that is one metric that we are also keen on understanding when we have the data set with us but for the multiple independent variables we may not be able to visualize this line right so then we resort only to the regression output instead of a plot to understand how good the independent variables fit with respect to the dependent variables. So that's that's one uh, interpretation of R squared. The other thing that we have here is standard error. And standard error is telling us that on average, how much does a data point 
estimated through the equation uh, deviate from its true value. Now what equation are we talking? We're talking about the regression equation which is always available to us um, in this form. So the dependent variable y median home price equals to beta 1 x plus beta naught. Now, there's a hat on top of them because they are estimates and these numbers, the equation numbers, these coefficients, they are coming right here from right here from regression. So essentially we have this equation set up for us we can always construct this equation right away by looking at these equations. The x independent variable is going to be there as it is. Uh, we could plug in values of interest rate to obtain median home price values as predictions if we have these coefficients. So this is the goal of regression to obtain these coefficients and these are available to us. Right so 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 then the question is how on average how much does each data point the original data point that we have how far away are they from the true value so if this is the regression line we want to see how far away this data point is from this regression line how far away is this data point from the regression line how far away is this data point from the regression line so this is kind of a residual error this is the residue that's left up this this error from the regression line and similarly this point how far away is it so we calculate our sum all of these errors square them take an average it kind of tells us how far away is the are, are these data points from the regression line so that standard error is, is is right here for us there's a formula for it too so you could have sum of squares residual divided by the n minus k minus 1 factor that we had here Okay, so where is sum of squares residual? This sum of squares residual is directly available to us here under SS, sum of squares. MS is the mean square, SS is the sum of squares. So if you look at residual and this number, 24060999851, and we divide it by n minus k minus 114, we can obtain this number, 41456. Okay, so this number is available to us as a ratio of these two numbers with the square root. This is the formula right here. Um, another uh, comment on standard error in terms of visualization. So let's look at this, for example. So this is the data point, and this is our regression line. right? So we are talking about how far away in y-axis is this data point from the regression line. And this error is then the residue. Okay, so this error is then telling us how far apart this data point is from the regression line. So that is um, that is something we compute for all the data points, square them, sum them, and we obtain them. So I, in fact, a formulation for this is also available to us here. If you look at this. SSE, this is what it is. The value, the true value of the data point minus the value coming from the regression line, difference squared sum. So that is giving us um, SSE. Okay, so now that being said, let us uh, head over to the next uh, point that we are interested in. Uh, but, but before I go there, understand that this standard error is the error in terms of the y values, right? how far apart each data point is in, in y-axis from the regression line, right? These are errors in y. There's also a similar term called standard error here, which is giving us standard errors for the coefficients, the intercept and the independent variable coefficient as interest rate percentage. So beta 1 hat and beta not hat. So you also get standard errors corresponding to them. This is the errors for these x terms, the terms that we have here um, for, for the independent variables. So that is an error in y, the one that you see up above, because it's an error in the predicted value, that's an error in y. But these errors right here for independent variables, standard error here is telling us the errors in the x dimension and the x axis, or the errors for the terms that are related with x axis. Okay, so there's a difference between this standard error and standard error here up on top. Now, we have looked at uh, quite a lot of these. Let's move on to, uh, and we've also looked at this, the SSE, the sum of squares um, residual um, 
error also. Now this is a sum of squares. We've seen how this is just a sum of how far a data point is on the on from the regression line, and we've kind of squared this distance and added it for all of the data points. So that's what this is. What is this first uh, number right here? One five zero three six eight and so on. So this is in fact the sum of squares regression. Where does this number come from? The sum of squares regression is also an error from the regression line, but this is in this direction. It's looking at the mean. It's looking at the error from the mean value. This is also an error in y, but this is an error of the regression line from the mean value of the y data points. So all of the data points have a y value, right? They, they, they correspond, if you look at our data, we have a y value corresponding to each of this data point. We have a y value and they all of them will have a certain mean value, right? You, I can take an average of these 16 numbers. So how far apart is our prediction, the regression line? For each data point, how far apart is it from their average value? This is coming, this is showing up in sum of squares regression. Okay, the formula for this sum of squares regression then is also a very simple formulation. We are looking at the predicted value, y hat, and subtracting the mean value from it. It's fairly simple, squaring it and summing it. So yi tells us that I have to take each data point and subtract it from one mean value. There'll be one number, the mean value, right? So this is again a sum, so you'll obtain one number. So then I know what SSR now is, sum of squares and regression. And this is that sum of squares. This is one number that we have, SSR. It's right here. Okay. So that is how this number also makes sense to us now. Uh, we now move on to this significance F. Now this tells us this is a probability which is coming from the F distribution, and that's okay. And this is the uh, F value of the test statistic. But what is it really? What is it really? A statistic for what p-value does this really um, mean right so what does it really mean so this is in fact telling us whether or not the relationship of our regression equation is significant whether or not it is credible so if this is less than alpha then this means that our relationship is in fact significant we this is a credible relationship whatever the coefficients and everything is showing up here this is something we can now look into because we have validity from this p-value the significance f so this is also an important metric which kind of uh, adds credibility to our regression by, by by looking at it by ensuring that this number is less than alpha in our case, we can see this is less than 0.05. It's less than 5% alpha that we had set out. So then the results of the regression are in fact credible and they are valid. So I'm, I, I can now proceed to look at the individual validity of these equation of these variables by looking at their p-values. But before that, I must look at the significance f, whether or not the entire results are significant, whether or not the relationship is significant enough or worth uh, interpreting or analyzing. So the first go-to is, in fact, this significance f. This is less than alpha. Now I am happy to interpret or understand the coefficients and how credible they are. So we move on now from significance f to the individual coefficients and their values. So we have in the intercept beta naught and the independent variable beta 1. In the equation interest rate percentage, we have the coefficients values. And there is an associated standard error with respect to each of these independent variables, which tells us what is the um, error on average when computing these independent variables. And we denote it by this SE, and we write the independent variable as a subscript here. So we have coefficients, we have standard error available to us, and their ratio is in fact giving us the test statistic, the T stat here also. We look at the T distribution, so we call it T stat, and their ratio is in fact giving us this value. Now remember one way to 
interpret or to uh, understand these coefficients is by saying that the null hypothesis is that the coefficients have a value of zero. Now if we run with this null hypothesis then whatever coefficient value that we do get from our sample this follows the same formulation for the, uh, the hypothesis testing that we have done previously. So we obtain this value, subtract it from the null value that we had set up and divide it by its corresponding standard error. That gives us the test statistic. In this case, it's the, from the t-distribution, we call it t-statistic. So that gives us this t-value, right? So, the, and, and, and if this is significant, then we could reject the null hypothesis that it's the null hypothesis is that its value is zero and if this is significant then we say okay it's uh, we reject the null hypothesis it's not zero whatever this is showing up this is in fact the true case this is in fact what's really happening okay if it's not significant then it's probably showing up by chance and it's not credible enough to be respected so then again it boils down to what is the p-value associated with the test statistic and the test statistic is that the null hypothesis, and the test statistic is, is corresponding to a hypothesis, right? So hypothesis here now is that the coefficients have a zero value. And obviously we want to test it. So we compute the test statistic, take the difference of the sample mean, then we have the null hypothesis mean, and we take that difference, divide by standard error, and we get a value. So we obtain this. Uh, quite literally, if we divide minus 2, 3, 4, 0, 9, the coefficient's value, by the standard error, the corresponding standard error, 7, 9, 1, 4, this is the standard error corresponding to this independent variable. So we're taking this ratio, 2, 3, 4, 0, 9, divided by 7, 9, 1, 4. We obtain the test statistic value. So you will get this number. So in short, coefficient divide, and because this is 0, it's always going to be 0. That's the null hypothesis, so it's really not a subtraction. So it's essentially just this number divided by standard error. Uh, so quite frankly, this coefficient's value, this number divided by 7914, you obtain test statistic. And we know how to calculate p-values from test statistics. We've done this in the previous videos. You have a test statistic value. Uh, the way it works in Excel is you use the positive value. If it's an, Even if it's negative, you make it positive. You use the positive value right here and you specify the degrees of freedom. It's not n minus 1, it's n minus k minus 1. We are accounting for the independent variable, so it's 14. This number is coming from right here. Okay, so it's 14, and we put it in the t distribution formula for the two-tail test. It's always a two-tail, and this gives us the p-value. That is how we are getting the p-value, and it's 0 0.01. It's less than alpha, less than 0 0.05, less than 5%, so that makes it significant so this adds credibility to this uh, independent variable interest rate. Now, the last piece of the puzzle is then the confidence intervals. How are we getting the confidence intervals and how are these numbers uh, making sense? Now, this is from the confidence interval formula, which is straightforward. We have the coefficients value and we add corresponding t value, which corresponds to 95% confidence, and we multiply it with the standard error for that independent variables coefficient right so and and we have the coefficient itself we have its standard error also notice coefficient it is available to us the value is available to us right here uh, minus two three four we have its standard error available to us so we have this and we have the standard error also so we've got these two sorted we only need to find what is the t value that corresponds to 95% confidence. And for an upper 95, we will add it. For a lower 95, we will subtract it. Okay, so this is fairly straightforward. It's a mathematical um, calculation in itself. Um, but I'm calculating here for the lower 95. For the upper, we just change this sign and get compute the number. So for the lower what is the t value with the 95 percent confidence right so now where are we getting this number from 2.144 again this number can be obtained by using the excel formula t inverse 2t so we plug in the probability value a five percent means it's 0 0.05 it's a two-tail test we're moving from probability to a t value 
right? Which is the reason why we're using the inverse formula in the T distribution. And we specify the degrees of freedom, which are n minus k minus 1, accommodating for the independent variables k. And it turns out to be, it is 14, available to us here, 14. Okay, so by using this formula, we obtain the T value corresponding to a 95% confidence. Now, there is a caveat here. This is 95% confidence, but we plug in the remaining 5% probability here. So if this was 90%, we would plug in 0.10, 10% here. So in the formula, for, for in Excel, you plug in probability, but in the T value is corresponding to the confidence, okay? So once this is plugged in, you can make these calculations. They are straightforward and you obtain these exact numbers for the lower 95 and the upper 95 confidence interval values. So that is pretty much uh, how we obtain these numbers and what they mean and these regression output on Excel looks like. Uh, this is what the regression output in Excel looks like. Now this is only for one independent variable. For multiple independent variables, you should expect that you will have a different value of k n minus k minus 1 will be different and then uh, but the rest of the, th the things they follow along uh, you will have different p-value here you see the same p-value because there's only one but when you have one there's only one independent variable so uh, it is pretty much the same but once you see different or multiple independent variables you will see different p-values and then the significance will also be different so you will first look for credibility from the significance level of the entire regression process and then you will see which independent variables have p-values less than alpha and then you will keep only those independent variables in your equation. Right. Um, thank you so much.